Uganda is a stunningly beautiful country, but it has been through hell. From the early 1800s on, it has been fraught with colonialism, corruption, and most recently, 20 years of war with the Lord's Resistance Army. The LRA targeted children to be used as instruments of war, and it's estimated that over 66,000 boys and girls were abducted to be used as fighters, porters, and sex slaves. It was an intensely brutal conflict, which also resulted in 1.7 million Ugandans leaving their villages for internally displaced persons camps. The war ended in 2006, and Ugandans are starting to rebuild, even though Joseph Konye is still alive and making headlines. The end of the conflict was not an end to violence, however, especially to women and children who continue to suffer domestic and sexual abuse. Is this a new story? One of the factors underlying ongoing cases of abuse, rape, domestic violence and other forms of human rights violations is a culture of impunity that happens in post-conflict countries. When you can't bring perpetrators to justice, when you can't hold people responsible for their actions, when there's no real enforceable law and order, then the cycle of violence just continues. And that's why War Child Canada has decided to focus its efforts here in northern Uganda on access to justice. So War Child's program in Uganda, it's been around for eight years, and we are in several different locations in the northern part of the country, which has experienced several decades of conflict. And so the work that we do is to really provide some of that legal infrastructure and to help to break that cycle. So we train lawyers, we train paralegals, uh, we work in the communities to sensitize people around the rights of women and children especially. We have a radio program as well that goes out to many tens of thousands of people around uh, legal issues and access to justice, and you need that legal resource in order to promote security, in order to rebuild and, and reconcile communities, um, in order to really prevent conflict from taking root again. War Child's Access to Justice program for women and child survivors of sexual and gender-based violence has grown enormously. In the last year alone, 1,400 victims have sought legal redress. 400 justice and legal actors have been trained, and hundreds of thousands of people in northern Uganda have been reached through human rights radio broadcasts and community gatherings. Still, there's huge demand, and the War Child program needs to expand, so the visit of Canadian legal advocates is very welcome. So it's a privilege to be hosting you here. Um, uh, I would like to take you through the legal program. It's a it's a big challenge for even the ordinary citizens of this country to access justice, but it becomes even more difficult for that woman and that child that has suffered violation. Extremely difficult. So. Around here, because of the war and the poverty, uh, they are kind of became a trend in the community where if somebody suffered violation, they would rather just keep quiet. So what kind of cases are there? Is it domestic abuse? What, what kinds of things are in here? The type of cases we have here, it ranges from child neglect, defilement, and we also have domestic violence. We also have uh, family and child desertion. Those ones that are civil, we always try as much as possible to mediate. If you look at the, the war, that lasted for over 20 years. Children, women suffered during the war. Now look at the effect of the war. These are children, women who felt most of the effect. Then, now that people are, the war has ended and people have, are going back to their homes from, from camps, it is even still women and children who are what? Who are suffering. Then another contributing factor is the neglect and maybe poverty. I'm not, not only maybe, but poverty. 
You see? Sexual and gender-based problems occur. War Child's initiatives need to be very broad-based in order to be effective. A variety of educational tools and outreach materials are used within the community. And as well, specialized legal training is provided to police officers, health care workers and some members of the judiciary. Uh, we train those in the justice law and other sector, wow. uh, where we have uh, the police, and then we have the local council. Those are the people who respond to cases of gender-based violence or in other cases at the local village level. And then uh, we have the health workers uh, who normally examine, provide medical examination and treatment for survivors of gender-based violence. So that is a way of you know trying to organize us within the justice and law sector to use the same tool and communicate the same messages to the community. Part of the work that War Child does here in northern Uganda is awareness raising. It's really important that community members understand and respect women and children's rights. This is an event that happens, well, last year in 2011, they did 111 of these community awareness events, and they're remarkably candid. The War Child who are here, they always are sensitized people, especially the community. For the last 24 years, we, when they have been in the war, there has been a lot of uh, bad behaviors and uh, they didn't have a life for themselves. They thought everybody was going to die. But now they are, there's apparent peace. They're now trying to change. And the War Child Canada is now trying to uh, uh, educate them so that they could live with hope, knowing that there is life mm -hmm. again. Northern Uganda is a very large geographical area, so it's very difficult for the war child staff to get out to those remote villages that really need legal help. So what they do is they enlist the aid of local villagers, and these people act in the community as a bridge to the war child staff. They hand out pamphlets, they connect victims with legal aid, with war child, and sometimes they're reconciliators too. The reason some of them are so very, very motivated is because they have their own devastating personal stories about the war. The rebels came and cooked in our compound. Then government soldiers came and found them. When they found them, they started shooting at each other. Then everyone scattered, running. My father, my mother got hit by bullets. My brothers and sisters were abducted and taken. That is the thing that made me fall into that pit. Betty lost her entire family that day. She survived only because she fell into a deep pit and was trapped for three days until the fighting was over. She eventually married and had six children, but was abandoned by her husband. Today, though life is day to day, she volunteers with War Child after working in the camps with child soldiers who somehow managed to return. The most common help I was giving was providing counseling. Because when they come back, they are mentally disoriented. They are aggressive to their parents. Some even want to kill their parents. And I go and counsel them. You see, a person who is mentally disoriented may go insane. Dreams, like nightmares, or some spirits unexpectedly come upon them, then they run. Then the spirits were giving assistance. They would buy goats perform acholi rituals because sometimes, while in the captivity, they killed people. Or dead persons were laid down and they were made to jump over them. Or people were killed and then they were told to lick the blood. And you are forced to lick the blood of that person, and then that act keeps scaring them. That is a difficult work that I was doing during the days of the IDP camps. Morris is another war child volunteer. His daughter was abducted while they were living in an IDP camp. She was nine years old and spent eight years held captive by the LRA until she finally escaped. What she told me was that when she went there, she was still young. She still did not have her first period, but she was taken and given to a man. It was her worst experience. There was also the problem of moving to various places and seeing people who were killed in front of her. Those are the terrible things that she faced. Even though Amu Jebifer came back to her father, she, like many returning child soldiers, was unwelcome. But Morris chose to shower her with love, and even though she had lost eight years of school, he arranged for vocational training as a seamstress, with outstanding results. 
When she was studying tailoring, when she graduated, I went during the school closing ceremony. She had emerged the best in the school that she was awarded a sewing machine. It was the director who handed over the award to her right in front of me. This gave me very big joy. Why is investing in women and girls a good idea? The reason why you invest in women and girls, I mean, it's, it's anywhere you look around the world. You know, we know that, for example, um, increased education levels among girls, that this decreases infant and maternal and child mortality. We also know, if you look at the data all around the world, we know that increased education levels as well and strengthening the rights of women and girls, that this re results in um, Im qual improved quality of life indicators, decreased fertility rates, and it dramatically decreases the ongoing risk of, of violence and armed conflict, again, all around the world. And it's something that we often overlook, you know, and yet we know that, for example, rape as a, as a crime of war is pervasive. And even in the aftermath of conflict, that continues to take place because there are no judicial mechanisms that they have at their disposal. There is no one to hold those perpetrators accountable. And, and that kind of almost societal rot has, has really taken root. And yet we don't think about it as being an immediate need, and yet it, it absolutely is. You know, you can't rebuild societies. You can't um, advance. You can't protect against future conflict unless you are working to protect and uphold fundamental human rights. And those rights begin with women and girls. Dr. Samantha Nutt has said, the greatest obstacles to human rights and international development will not be met by doctors, politicians and engineers, but by lawyers and judges. The legal community can play a substantial role in building peace, but it's long-term development and it's not as easy to understand as sending food and medicine, blankets or even goats. So the next time you're thinking about charitable giving, think about long-term development, think about justice. It's not as easy to explain, but it's well worth the effort. When you see someone in a day saying, thank you very much, at least I've got help. Mm -hmm. Your heart softens and you go back home and you're happy. So that's it.